I'm here representing the Annenberg Research Network on International Communications. Uh, we are a much different kind of outreach. One of, the, one of the issues having to do with international communications is to do it well, you need a fair amount of business, law, uh, economics, uh, political science, uh, computer science, engineering. Uh, and by the way, if you do it internationally, you need to know how the laws work in multiple countries. So as a result, we end up mostly with graduate students because it simply takes more time to learn the kinds of issues that we're dealing with. So we're not an expansive group. We are really a mentoring group for those students who are interested. In terms of what we focus on, um, it's really three things as it relates. Our intervening variables, if you like, is ways to create robust interoperable infrastructure. How do you maintain a global network? How do you strengthen a global network? Two, on issues of innovation. And three, uh, particularly my colleague uh, Francois Barr, on issues of development and sort of what that means. So those are the three issues. And all of those leading to a question of what kinds of policies can promote those things. So that is really the raison d'etre of what we do. We're look at focusing on those, th that area. What we do not do, which is quite different from many of the faculty at Annenberg, is we don't focus on content. Um, most people sort of look at, hear something, uh, something is generated, it impacts somebody, and how does that change them? Are they more or less violent? Are they more or less likely to smoke? And we don't do that. We really look at how do you create the robust network that is necessary. Now, in doing that, we really focus, uh, we made a, a conscious decision, particularly after one of our core people passed away last year, uh, with Wally Bear which made it more difficult. It's, so it's Francois and myself, and occasionally we reel uh, Manuel in. And we try and cover all of the PhD students who are focused on international communications. So that is our core group. What we end up doing is three kinds of projects, uh, from simplest to most complex. One. We do everything we can with this limited pot of money we have to support the PhD students to write papers, attend conferences, publish. Um, we, to make it in this field, they have to get out. So we are mentoring on a pretty much one-on-one -on -one level all of those students. And we only get one or two a year in the PhD program. Uh, and we concentrate on sort of getting these folks ready so we were very pleased, for instance, that our student, Julian Mayland, who graduated uh, last year, got what I think was the best job for, out of Annenberg last year. He is a tenure-track uh, assistant professor at the University of Indiana right now. So that's the kind of thing we focus on. We get a couple of students a year, and we try and help them do well. Second, to try and spread the word and. Uh, get a wider sense of the importance of the issues that we think are important. Um, we try to bring in uh, a few expert speakers uh, each year. Now, the problem that we have with that is we live up at Kirchhoff. Getting students to hike up there uh, most of the time is a little difficult. Therefore, what we have done is partnered with the Monday seminar series. So we will come in uh, to Peter Manji and say, we have this great uh, speaker. Why don't you uh, do, feature them in a Monday uh, talk? And that has worked pretty well. Um, so not all of them have been able to be scheduled. And then we do something with our own students. But in the last couple of years, people that have come have included Reed Hunt, the former chairman of the FCC, Kevin Werbach. Uh, from uh, Penn, Wharton at Penn, who then subsequently uh, published uh, a, a feature in IJOC with one of our students, so that that has led to really a very positive outcome. Pierre de Vries, a longtime head of uh, stuff for Microsoft, 
but doing a lot of the Washington policy. Uh, Ken Kukier, the current data editor of uh, The Economist, who wrote the book uh, Big Data, and uh, Shane Greenstein, uh, chaired professor at Kellogg Northwestern. Uh, so all of these came, were available uh, to A, give a talk, and B, then mentor. We are very careful to always have meetings with the critical PhD students to work on that. The third thing we have done is we try once a year to hold a conference, a meeting, um, which either promotes what has been done or uh, pushes uh, new uh, work into the future. Uh, this has included uh, an early meeting some years ago on network neutrality uh, and the creation of actually the Annenberg principles on network neutrality, which have been, were subsequently picked up and quoted. You know, things move fast, so it's, uh, it pushed the process forward. We were very active in creating an internet governance forum, uh, which we partnered with the Aspen Institute to try and get <coughs> a major internet, uh, create an internet regime uh, for governance. Uh, some of it was very successful. Uh, we learned some lessons. It ultimately collapsed, uh, largely because the same people that uh, Stacy was just talking about did everything in their power to stop it. Um, the Hollywood people did not want progress, largely because that meant intellectual property would have to be on the table, and they didn't want to deal with intellectual property on the table uh, in a group of issues because they were afraid, probably correctly, that they would lose. And therefore, they took a blocking a little bit. This year, uh, in September, um, Francois uh, Barr organized a uh, seminar, which again was jointly with the Monday afternoon series, and then we went on for a half day um, on connecting people for development, why public access information and communication technologies matter, uh, which we brought in uh, a number of people from around uh, the country and the world. Uh, now, unlike others, uh, we deal with diversity indirectly, not directly. So the research assistants have all been diverse. Uh, at this one, we had Arab Assay, a former PhD student uh, at USC who's now at Washington, who's from Ghana. So we are very careful to try and have a diverse group of speakers, but we're not big enough. And the topics that we deal with are not specific diversity topics. Uh, except in terms of the development gets there because development is by definition pretty much diverse. Uh, we have a, a project that and, and we finally we have a conference that we are planning uh, that is uh, moving forward for the fall uh, with uh, again one of our graduate students, Lena Schwartz and Manuel Castells on uh, money as communication, the technology, culture, and economic practice. Uh, which uh, is right now scheduled for October, which will look everything from um, Bitcoin to payment systems and how that enables uh, change, why it, it helps a more robust communications network. Our sort of raison of going forward in these kinds of issues, uh, you know, money drives a whole lot of uh, things with this. If you look at international ICT, it is a huge industry. It's the global network is a multi-trillion dollar effort. We figure that about five trillion dollars a year is spent on ICT. That about 20 percent of all new jobs global, globally each year are ICT. Uh, focused, and that if you don't have a network that can maintain uh, the robustness, it's not going to destroy the internet. But if the growth rate is one or two percent less than it has been because of the tangles and the anti-competitive activities of countries and companies, uh, you can do the math pretty easily. Five trillion times two percent less jobs and growth is a large number. 
So that is where we are pushing this. Uh, we are a more specialized and focused group, in part because we try we try and get pieces to undergraduates, but frankly, our, under, our undergraduates yet don't yet have the breadth of knowledge that we need. So we try and help them get little bits and pieces of it, but we haven't been able to use them effectively, at least to date. So that's what we're up to. Uh, we're sort of the stealth organization trying to proselytize that this is really important. Uh, we've had some success, and you know, we're, ple we're very pleased that we have a small uh, number of students who are doing very well. So it's a, di it's a, it's a different take from Stacy. Yes? How about, if, if we looked around, I mean, the international pieces, as you and I know very well, is, is important and increasingly important. Um, do we have enough faculty on the comm side who are working on that to satisfy the immediate interest of a handful of students who come working on that? Do we need to hire more? And sort of who, among our competitors, who has the most, who has the largest international component um, in their comp program? Well, the, oh, the answer to all questions, as you know, is we, of course, need more faculty. But you know, the easiest, are, are you offering to step down and rejoin the faculty? Um, because well, I, I don't need to step down and join the faculty. I'm already on the uh, yeah, so, uh, and, and teach, by the way. I know that. I know that. I'm kidding. Um, it would be helpful to have um, a little bit more law and economics in this. Uh, we have from time to time worked with Simon Wilkie, a former um, chief, chief economist of the FCC, who's taking a new job. He will be, as of uh, this summer, the chief economist of Microsoft, For the first time they've gone to a full-time chief economist. Um, They've had part-time. He's the first full-time chief economist. Uh, the guy from Michigan? Anyway, that's... At any rate, so my, my we, we work with him, and it's very, we, we think it's very important that our students get economic expertise, because a lot of them are afraid of numbers, afraid of economics, so that when we get one with those skills, it is very useful. We would like to have, ideally, and what we lost when Wally passed away, he was in sort of engineering but also law. We'd really like to have uh, um, some international law, uh, intellectual property spectrum and the like, standards kinds of issues. What about, I mean, what about the other half of your question? The other, the nobody has a lot, is the answer. The other places where there are, um, there are, indi you know, there, if you get two or three individuals, you get uh, Michigan State, Penn State, uh, George Washington, all have some people who do it. There are a lot of people who float around um, Washington, D.C. The, uh, the meeting that is most important for our group is an annual meeting of, called the TPRC, the Telecommunications Policy Research Council, which is, takes place in September of each year in Washington. And it's sort of a unique meeting because it's about a third academics, a third uh, government, a third industry. And then there are a bunch of NGOs. And with Larry's help, we have been sort of encouraging more of our students. And I'm making a push uh, that to get uh, all of the relevant TPRC, all of our relevant internationally focused students to TPRC this year. So we have a couple of freebies, and I'm urging them that that's where they, sh that's something that they ought to be doing. Uh, so that TPRC is more, if you look at who comes to TPRC other than the Washington schools, um, the biggest uh, group comes from Penn State. I don't think anybody has a cluster. That's right. There are individuals scattered around. So you were thinking of Milton at, yeah. at Syracuse, but, right. but that's kind of Milton. I don't think he's got a group there that I'm aware of. 
Uh, he has, Lee McKnight knows a little of it there as well. Japan has a number of international programs, but they're not particularly policy oriented. They're more on the cultural, cultural end. And they, they vary, you know, Monroe, you know, it's, it, there's no coherent club. Which is curious. Um, well, it's part it's of the monetary. whole thing it's, it's we've a, been working on, that, you know, that, yeah. that there was a decline in the field of communication in the 80s on in what, I don't know, what Ernie and I think of, or, you know, yeah. uh, as you know, sort of the policy, you know, area of which this is then part, you know, sort of economic, political intersections, both nationally and internationally. You know, and we've been part of a group that's, you know, now co you know, working with the Social Science Research Council to try and reboot all of that. I mean, I think in some ways it was a consequence of a generational mm -hmm. transition from a group that had been, you know, sort of those sort of retired uh, in the 80s and didn't leave uh, many students. Uh, it was partially what Jonathan said, a kind of math phobia on the part of people who go into it. But I also think it was part of the times. I, you know, I think part of that 80s, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, Reagan, Thatcher, neoliberalism, you know, leave it all to the, to the market, you know, to get the, get public policy out of the, of these areas had an effect, you know, in terms of, yeah. of interest in jobs. So now it's kind of trying to, to get it back. And the tricky part in an academic world where the pipeline moves very slowly is how you begin to train the students and put them in a position to work with students. And it's happening, but it, you know, it, it, you know, and everybody is attacking regulatory economists. Uh, and that's something we desperately need. Uh, the one other person, of course, who's very active in everything is Ellie Noem at Columbia. But Ellie uh, has not school. produced a whole lot of students because he sits in a business school. Yeah, no, he's in a business school and doesn't, uh, no, he's, he's, he's in our SSRC group now. Yeah. The, the other thing that we uh, have, have to put on the table is someone who does what's traditionally called area studies. You know, yeah. we had Hernan from uh, did Latin America. Yeah. Uh, we had Felix who, who did kind of uh, trans-border yeah. issues, especially among Hispanics. Uh, we really don't have an Africanist, a Latin American person, someone who really works on Asia from... I think I'm looking at an Africanist. Yeah, but he don't do Africa. No <laughs> He's a bureaucrat as much as. But I mean, we I mean, we do have a uh, an assistant professor on the comm side mm -hmm. who does do China. Yeah, I mean, we, Josh does is an is a area right. scholar in a cultural way. Right, and so we we do have that. But again, in terms of yeah. uh, what's wonderful about these centers and this conversation, mm -hmm. although speaking of PR, we've got to do a better job of either not holding it on Friday or making it required so that yeah. this conversation is more robust. But well, thank you. This is you know, what, what we all, one other thing, we, there's a chicken and egg problem with our students. That we get one or two, but uh, a year in the new crop of PhD students. But when we try and offer either at the undergraduate or the graduate level, um, courses on economics or regulation or policy, uh, there's a big yawn among most of our students. So Leon and I were giving a wonderful course, but it just it got three students and six auditors, uh, and then we so we can't get the people to come in and sort of do the basic research. And I don't know quite how to deal with that. Well, just two points on that. One is it's not unheard of in the doctoral program to get very small courses. That's a, that's the size of our rhetoric courses yeah. too three and four students, the nature is if you're offering a variety of areas, you know, that you, you, the pie gets sliced rather rather thin. We are, I think, doing better and, um, yep. at the undergraduate level, yes. where we've built, you know, what we call economic literacy and media economics into our undergraduate program, one of our core classes, which is now up to about 90 or 100 uh, students over, 100. over under a semester. So, and then there are, you know, advanced courses beyond that. So we're doing what we can, but as I said, the pipeline is a, is a slow one, and our undergraduate pipeline isn't going to feed our doctoral program because that's not how that's how that works. It works, but it, it is. It's coming. Yeah, but I have an observation that the, uh, 
certainly at the undergraduate level, there's a lot of interest in this particular subject area. They're, they're, they're much more open to it, and they hunger for it. Yeah. But you're right, it's a little bit way down the line, but I think there's a flood of people coming. Yeah. And I think the way in which we define this is going to actually determine a lot about the future direction of this kind of scholarship, because mm -hmm. they're coming real fast, and their questions are real different. <laughs> real different. Can I ask a really mundane question? At the yeah. end of the line here, is the is when they go out the gate, are they going to an academic post or are there other policy both posts? Kinds, both kinds. Both. both kinds. I'd say this is well something that we and in this in this in this plant that question in this sentence in this sentence we certainly includes Ernie, me, and Jonathan, but not all of our colleagues are very clear in talking with our students that we are not presuming that the only career goal for doctoral students is, you know, is to become academics. Right? There are lots of ways to work. In this domain, I mean, we have I mean, one of uh, Jonathan's students who's finishing, you know, now, right now, in the Jack Jackie, is looking at both academic and non-academic jobs. This is clearly one of the areas in which this is, uh, you know, fairly obvious that there are uh, multiple career paths, and they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the one who comes following that, a fellow named Alec Mehta, is looking very clearly at policy jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, 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 and uh, uh, Jacqueline is looking less at comm jobs That's and more at business school That's right. jobs, policy school uh, jobs. Uh, uh, I, I'm pretty proud of what we've been able to do so far. I think we probably are at the upper end of the distribution of students who go to MIT and University of Michigan and Indiana, and also some of them go into Microsoft or they go into other areas. So. There was some recruiting of PhD students at South by Southwest that were looking for, they flew in, some people were flown in by Southwest. Southwest. Yeah, they were flown in there to talk because they, they usually don't do any kind of job thing, but there was some kind of reference thing. My sister was part of it and she was stunned by how many people were coming in there with a they were interacting with who just had a PhD and they were looking at mm -hmm. jobs and all these tech places were trying to grab some of these people. Uh, and Microsoft Research is becoming increasingly interesting so that we hired Mike Anani away from them after he got a PhD at Stanford and Kevin Driscoll is now going there for a two-year postdoc. Uh, so one of our PhD... Microsoft Research though is an interesting... It's a really interesting, interesting animal. This is the old Rockefeller Institute University model. It's a graduate school without students. Uh, they've hired very good uh, faculty, tenured faculty uh, and junior faculty from various universities, given them what they say is the equivalent of tenured jobs. You know, the future will tell yeah. uh, how that works because it's only been a few years, but they're actively engaged in research. They've got some of the best uh, relatively young scholars in the social media area there. Yep. Uh, and as you said, Kevin, one of our students who's finishing is going to be a postdoc there. One of our junior faculty had, was a postdoc there before he came. So they take postdocs, but they don't have graduate students. They have no, they have no degree program. They have no degree program. They're not in that sense. They don't have to be an academic institution. They don't have to be a what they, that stuff. They just hire yeah. people to do research, and they publish. Yes. They're visible in the field. You know, some, of, some good friends and colleagues of mine are and yeah. they, I've been written, writing letters for them the way I write letters for people getting academic appointments. You know, they, they, they get people to you know, write letters you know, about them and they hire them and they give them... Because <coughs> I know at least two people who gave up, or at least have so far appearing to be giving up tenured positions elsewhere to go there. Uh, they must have high salary. Yes. Well, I don't think Microsoft is, uh, is a not, challenge on, out. on that. They're in Cambridge. Uh, they're in that Kenmore Square area. Right there, like, yeah, ooh, yeah. It's getting to be pretty high. And many of them also then become fellows at Berkman Center. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Harvard Berkman uh, Center, which is the law, um, law out of Harvard Law School. Yeah, a lot of overlap with, with Berkman and with the uh, MIT. Program in comparison. Something that we, we tried once, and uh, it, it, we, we need to sort of start revisiting uh, how do we create a network that has uh, individuals who like what we do, who work with us, yeah. and who happen to be at Microsoft or happen to be at the UN or happen to be at. Uh,